Hi, everyone. Welcome to Foresight Space Group. It's the first uh, seminar in 2024 in the series. So really excited to uh, both have Edmund Kite here and Kriya. And we've already talked a little bit offline about a few of the bits that may come up, but I'll also share more info about Edwin here in the chat. I'll share a little bit more info about previous seminars that are relevant for this topic in case you want to do some uh, background reading afterwards. Uh, and with that, uh, please take it away, Kuyan. Uh, if you want to say a few more words about Edwin and otherwise, Edwin, uh, please take it away. Oh, I'm going to say a few words first. And first thing I want to say is I'm so glad you're here, Edwin. I didn't really know about you, but since I was um, studying up before this uh, seminar, um, I'm super impressed and really excited about the kinds of things you're going to be able to tell us and the questions you're going to be able to answer. Uh, two minor uh, amusing notes is that I was, and I was with Bob actually at the landing of the Perseverance rover, I believe, at the Mars Society conference many years ago. And that was exciting. And then second thing I want to say is you're at the University of Chicago, which is my alma mater. I went to lab school. Yeah, that counts. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyway, that's an inside joke, but it's very important in my development. Anyway, so Edwin's going to give a talk for about half an hour or so, and then I'll ask some questions and then you all can ask questions. You know, it's the usual thing. So let's get started. You just take it away, Edwin. Thank you very much for that introduction, Creel. Can everyone see full screen? All right. Okay. So when we look up at the night sky, what do we see? For thousands of years, our answer was the realm of the gods and spirits. But since 400 years ago, we've had a different answer. Uh, we see the night sky as a playground for surprisingly beautiful physics and chemistry. And perhaps the biggest change in the last few decades has been to add, maybe there's biology as well. But now I want to introduce another way of looking at the night sky. This is motivated by our growing understanding of the deep past of our own planet, constraints on the origin of life, uh, on how planets form, and now exoplanet research. Origin of life depends on boundary conditions and parameters. If your value of such and such a parameter is too high or too low, you don't get origin of life. Planet formation and evolution also depends on parameters. If these are too high or too low, then maybe the planet forms too big or too small or suffers a giant impact at just the wrong time. Maybe the habitable planet climate doesn't persist for long. And what we've learned over the past few decades of research is that there are lots and lots of these parameters. If you pick a random spot in a many-dimensional hypercube, it has lots of edges and lots of vertices. So you're probably close to an edge or a vertex, right? So the alive portion of this plot is much smaller than the dead part. And ideas like this, you know, could be worked out with, you know, lots of detail and the references at the bottom of the slide, but this gives the basic intuition. And so another view of the night sky is that it's entirely dead or almost entirely dead and unnecessarily in that if being a living planet depends on lots and lots of parameters, then many worlds are a small perturbation away from being living planets. For example, uninhabited yet habitable planets or planets that are uninhabitable but would be habitable if things were just a little bit different. Now for this audience, I'm just going to assert that living planets are better than dead ones. I with that background, how can we warm Mars? The artist's impression on the left shows stages in warming Mars. And the idea is that it's a bit like descending a mountain on Earth. The current state is too cold for life at the surface. As Mars warms, we descend the mountain, and the environment first allows cyanobacteria to live, then the environment allows lichens to live, and so on. As according to a recent review paper of what would happen if you warmed Mars and inoculated it with Earth life, with the full development of the bryophyte uh, ecosystem, the surface of Mars will appear vastly different from that shown in the cameras of rivers. Rocks will be dotted in patches and clumps of lichens and mosses. Depending on the availability of surface moisture, significant areas will be covered in carpets and hummocks of uh, mosses, and Mars will assume a distinctly green aspect. Now, this does not get to an atmosphere that humans can breathe. That would require a second stage in which photosynthesis helps to raise the oxygen level. Today, I will focus on the first stage only, what's shown on this slide, which is warming Mars to enable a photosynthetic biosphere like shown here. Now, Scott Hubbard talked about this a little bit in our previous Foresight talk, but both of NASA's Mars, active Mars rovers are exploring the traces of the greatest known environmental catastrophe, which is that Mars once had river networks and lakes and a habitable climate, but lost it. So on the right is Perseverance Rover's field site, a river delta and lake deposits. And on the other side of the planet, here is Curiosity's field site, where it sold 4065 of the mission, 
tucked in behind that mesa in the midfield there with a great view uphill, a five kilometer high mountain of sedimentary rock that was suggested pre-landing to record the great drying of Mars. And what Curiosity has found so far is consistent with that pre-landing suggestion. So this is the most fun I've had in my career. It's interplanetary multi giga year forensics with the bonus hope that what we learn about Mars can teach us about planets in general. Okay, so billions of years ago, Mars was habitable, much warmer than it is now. But Mars's surface today is unhabitably cold. So this is the zeroth order obstacle to establishing a photosynthetic biosphere on the surface of Mars. So that's all past. Could humans restore a warm climate in the near future? The modern discussion of this was started by Carl Sagan, shown in the top left. And there have been NASA summer studies for almost 50 years, lots of work on these approaches since then. And Casey Hammer from this group has the latest improvements on the orbiting mirrors approach mentioned here. And so the anticipated ease of implementing warming Mars has varied over the years. The first probes, okay, so this is a funny diagram. The x-axis is time, and on the y-axis, if it's plots near the top, then this was when a time in the development of thinking about warming Mars when we thought it would be relatively easy. And if it plots near the bottom, that's a time in the development of thinking about warming Mars when we thought it would be harder. So the first probes showed a planet that looked like the moon, but then calculations by Chris McKay, building on work by Carl Sagan, showed that Mars could be close to a tipping point where it would release abundant carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Sounds good. And then Margarita Marinova, elaborating on work by Mimi Gerstel, found the optimal cocktail of super greenhouse gases to do that. Uh, you need about 40 gigatons of fluorine in the atmosphere. But, did you uh, say fluoride? What did you say? 40 gigatons of what? The, green, the super greenhouse gases in Margarita Marinova's calculation are you know, uh, rich in both carbon and fluorine, but the fluorine is the thing that's hard to get, and you need 40 gigatons of it to get uh, strong warming in her calculations. And you like CFCs or something? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're uh, yeah, exactly. However, Joukowsky and Edwards underscored in a 2018 paper that the tipping point idea doesn't work because there's just not enough carbon dioxide that will be easily volatilized. And more recently, Laura Kerber and Robin Wordsworth suggested a local warming approach, tiling the surface with silica aerogel to create a solid state greenhouse effect. And also today I'll talk about a global warming idea. And so recently things are looking up. May I interrupt for one yes. moment with two short questions, which you can answer whenever or yeah. not. One is that I remember a long time ago in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society, I believe there was a proposal to somehow use nukes to put some kind of, or maybe not nukes, you put like some thin layer of soot yeah. on the yeah. coals. wonder if that's factored in here. And then the other thing I wanted to ask is you have this paper with an intriguing title called Why Mountain Tops Are Cold. And yeah. will you discuss that and how it relates to this? So to answer the first question, that's an elaboration of Sagan's original suggestion of uh, lowering Mars's albedo uh, to release volatiles from the polar caps. So you do release volatiles that way, but you do not release enough for strong warming because we know more about how many volatiles there are in the polar caps than Sagan did. Um, so the technique works, but it's not as good as it was once thought. To your second question, I don't plan to talk about it. But I have backup slides in this deck. So if you want to stick around at the end, I'd be happy to give an overview of them for you on Thanks. that. So what are the raw ingredients for a warmed habitat? So Mars has polar caps that are mostly water ice. And if they melt, that's enough water for a 35 meter deep global layer if it was spread out evenly. In addition, one third of Mars's surface has shallow buried water ice. We know this from a bunch of indirect means like neutron spectroscopy, but most spectacularly from recent impact craters like the one on the left, which formed, I think, in the last couple of years, and it splashes up the shallow water ice. You can just see the ice fragments in the pictures. It's the kind of bluish or whitish chunks uh, ejected from this impact crater. So we're actually not short of H2O substance. A point that always comes up when you talk about warming Mars is if you warm it up, when you lose the atmosphere? And atmospheric loss to space rates are, and will remain in the future, negligibly slow. Atmospheric escape of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc., from solar system planets isn't overfilling a bathtub. It's not right to think, add too much atmosphere and you'll, you'll lose it. That's not the right way of thinking about it. A better way of thinking about it is it's like a cat sipping from a tub. The cat sips at a constant rate, and we know that rate. It turns out to be, for Mars, about one millibar per billion years. And we have six millibars now. So a warmed Mars, even though Mars lacks a global magnetic field, will hold on to its atmosphere. The cat just isn't very thirsty. 
And even though Mars doesn't have a global magnetic field, it turns out that doesn't matter for thinking about warming Mars. So if you combine those two facts, that Mars has a lot of water ice, and the atmospheric loss rates are going to stay negligibly slow, then we can say something about what will happen to Mars's climate as the sun heats up over the next six billion years. And this is from a paper just published by Bruce Tchaikovsky, who's the leader of NASA's MAPER mission. Carbon dioxide absorbed in the regolith and locked up in the South Polar ice cap will diffuse into the atmosphere, providing up to 50 millibars total pressure. That's 10 times today. That will further increase the temperature via greenhouse warming. Surface water could drive an atmospheric water cycle somewhat analogous to present-day Earth's, which could create a global climate climate conducive to the existence of widespread surface life. At the same time, by the way, Earth, our planet, will have undergone a runaway greenhouse without human intervention. Earth becomes uninhabitable long before the sun becomes a red giant. So a warmer Mars is going to happen anyway. So do we want to happen in the far future or do we want to happen in the near future? Oh, and the picture in the background, by the way, is just the, a picture of the a lake in the Atacama. It's an almost lifeless environment. So it would be, you know, a picture of what Mars might look like in the future without our intervention. All right. So right now we're in the phase of robotic exploration. And if we want to have a photosynthetic biosphere, we need to do three things, at least. We need to warm the climate by more than 35 Kelvin. We need to reduce the surface UV flux. And we need to remediate the soil chemistry probably through microbial processes. But uh, and if you're interested in the, uh, I'm going to focus today on warming climate. If you're interested in the other two aspects, then I check out these references. So if you're going to do that, I'm going to further constrain it by saying you would like to do it with a current or imminently available technology at a cost no more than the existing space effort and do it quickly because humans are impatient in less than 50 years. Carbon dioxide alone is not enough. Carbon dioxide is a great greenhouse gas. There's already quite a lot of it in Mars' atmosphere. It provides only five Kelvin of greenhouse warming. And the extra carbon dioxide that you can volatilize from the ice caps and from desorbing the soil does not fundamentally change that situation. It does not get you the whole way to allowing liquid water on Mars again. Okay, this is the state of the art. What you're seeing is a 3D model of the response of Mars climate to adding super greenhouse gases, the optimal gas mix. And so the red line shows the seasonal cycle after you've added the super greenhouse gases, much warmer than the present state of the blue line. On the right, how much warming you get as a function of latitude and longitude. So where the topography is low, the atmospheric column is thick, and so the greenhouse warming is greater. That's the white spot in the bottom right. Okay, so this is the state of the art. But it requires 10 to the 14 kilograms of fluorine, and that's very sparse on Mars's surface, 10 parts per million by weight on the samples that we have. So the scale of mining that is implied is the sum of all that in human history, perhaps more, stripping the surface, Sagan phrase this as, you know, stripping the surface to many meters depth. And so if this is the best we can do, then this is not a problem for our generation. This is a problem for some future generation with better technology. So that was a short talk, if that's the best we can do. And I'm going to suggest an alternative approach, and it's suggested by natural Mars dust aerosol. So the Mars sky is always dusty, and due to its small size, Mars dust is lofted to high altitude. It's present up to 60 kilometers above the surface, and its uh, peak concentration is 20 kilometers above the surface. Okay, this dust, however, has an anti-greenhouse effect. It cools at the day side. Can we understand this cooling effect by looking at the spectrum? The top panel, the sigma x subscript R, that's the extinction cross-section for a single dust particle, the sum of scattering and absorption as a function of wavelength. So the dotted line is just the scattering contribution. So Mars does block sunlight at short wavelengths, so less energy absorbed from the sun. But in the infrared regions where Mars leaks energy to space, which is the pink band, the less the infrared escape. So the net effect of natural Mars dust is to cool the day side. The key wavelength ranges for cooling Mars are the, the reason Mars stays cold is because it loses energy in the pink band. That's the peak black body emission from Mars's surface leaking energy to space. The gray band is where the natural carbon dioxide greenhouse effect is effective at trapping heat. And so it's either side of the gray band, about 22 microns and about 10 microns, Mars's two so-called spectral windows that we need to close with a greenhouse agent if we're going to warm Mars. Natural dust does not do this well at all. Uh, you can see by the red line that it has a small extinction cross-section relative to solar in those spectral windows. And the bottom panel just describes whether the light is scattered forward or backwards. And where it's one, it's scattered forward. And so this just says that the light is forward scattered. Okay, so natural dust doesn't do what we want. We can sketch what the ideal aerosol 
would look like if we wanted to warm Mars with artificial aerosol. First, it would have to be as small as natural dust in order to get blown around by the wind and well mixed. It would have to let sunlight through. I would have to block the infrared. Those are the key ingredients for a ideal warming artificial aerosol. So the theory of optimal electromagnetic extinction has many applications. And it's largely worked out actually by a Nobel Prize winner, J.H. Van Vleck, although he didn't win the Nobel for this work. So based on this, we hypothesized that conductive rods with lengths tuned to resonate with Mars infrared are going to behave like the ideal warming dust that I sketched in PowerPoint on the previous slide. However, analytic formulae uh, perform poorly in this regime, so we needed to do some, it became computationally intensive. And we teamed up, and the lead author of the project uh, that I'm going to describe is Samena Ansari, who's a grad student at Northwestern. And uh, Ramses Ramirez did uh, 1D climate modeling, basically checked that our 3D climate modeling wasn't off base. Uh, Liam Steele uh, helped with the 3D climate modeling, and uh, Huma Masseni is the lead for the uh, uh, design of the nanoparticle site. Okay, in order to calculate the optical properties of the nanorods, we had to consider every possible orientation because Brownian motion, just the jostling by the atoms in the atmosphere, will randomize the orientation of the nanoparticles. And so we integrated over that, which took a lot of CPU hours. We found that the nanorods do indeed have basically the ideal optical properties. So on the top, you have a, a log scale, and you can see that the peak extinction from the nanorods in the spectral windows is up to 100 times geometric, which is also is about 100 times the peak extinction in the solar. So they let the sunlight in, they forward scatter it down to the surface, but they trap the infrared through a combination. Wait, question. Of Wait, quick question. Is this for the integrated... Uh, rod distribution or just the optimal rod distribution? So this is random orientation. So it's inter integral over a lot of rod orientations. Yeah. So this is good. The next step was to include these in a 3D climate model. And we basically took the observed natural dust distribution and considered this as like a conservative uh, way of thinking about how high the nanorods be lofted in the atmosphere. They're much lighter and much more easily suspended than natural dust. So they probably get higher up than the natural dust, but we painted in a natural dust-like distribution. And so this is the conceptual picture. You release the nanorods near the surface during the daytime when strong natural winds will sweep them high up in the atmosphere and then distribute them globally. In principle, you only need one release point for a global distribution. And this is familiar if you've seen pictures of global dust storms on Mars. They start at one place, but the dust spreads planet-wide. This lets most of the sunlight in, but traps most of the outgoing uh, long-wave radiation leading to a strong greenhouse effect. Each nanorod is falling towards the ground, but the turbulence is uh, lofting it back up again, and so its lifetime is long. Uh, against settling, it's about six years. Against coagulation, meaning nanorods bumping into each other, and we just assume they stick, it's, it's about 10 years. So settling would limit the lifetime. Okay. This is the warming that we uh, calculated. So on the x-axis of the column density of nanorods, uh, it's a log scale. That's, so the warming is roughly uh, linear in the log, of uh, how many nanorods uh, you add. This is a very common outcome from greenhouse effect calculations, both with gases and aerosols. And so the black triangle shows the point at which widespread surface melting would stop. So why is this only 250 Kelvin? Why don't you have to get all the way to 273 Kelvin for widespread surface melting to stop? That's just because of latitudinal or seasonal variation. So the southern ice belt gets warm during southern summer, and so that ice belt will start to undergo seasonal melting at temperatures quite a bit less than uh, annual average temperature of 273 Kelvin. And what we found is that uh, we can get increased mass efficiency by moving to thinner nanorods. And that's a promising direction for future research. The total mass of nanorods in the atmosphere? 1.5 times 10 to the 14 times whatever is on the x-axis. But it's, it's for the red curve. It's a, a factor of 10,000 less than the mass of the ideal greenhouse gas mix. So right, now, I'm just asking for a number here. In other words, you've got how many tons of nanorods in the atmosphere? About 10 million. So 10 to the 10 kilograms. So you need to be making then about uh, one and a half million tons per year to, to maintain that density. That's correct. And I'll get into that in a few slides. Okay. So this is just the, this is as you warm Mars up, what melts first? So what melts first is the southern ice belt. And that's just because Mars has an eccentric orbit in which the southern summer turns out to be warmer than northern summer. That's the main reason. 
But if you continue to add nanorods, you will get melting planet-wide. The horizontal blue lines here are meant to show that the ice distribution is not uniform. There is more ice uh, towards the north of that top blue line and south of that bottom blue line. Hey, I have a quick question. Yeah. The graph that you showed, uh, maybe it was not for the rods, but it was of the um, temperature, it had th three or four temperature uh, increase curves on it in different bold colors. They don't even get up to the to zero C. Like they're down there. Oh, this is, oh, I see. These do get up. Yeah, but even these, they don't get up to 270. Isn't that where they have to go to melt water ice? This is the this is the map that shows the oh, temperatures that are relevant okay. to melting. This Actually, is... you don't need to melt the ice. You just need to raise the vapor pressure of water, and you'll start getting water vapor in the atmosphere, even if it's not melted. And the water vapor would be a potent uh, greenhouse gas. But I, I see agree. that in this, in this chart, you already have places that are above 270, really half the planet, basically. Up the planet, yeah. So this is the warm season. This is not the uh, this is not the annual average. This is the warm season temperature. Yeah, but yeah, half the planet above the freezing point. Yeah, this probably is more intuitive, Creon. So if the the average temperature is, you know, you take the average in a horizontal direction, and so the melt zone is basically half the planet, but only during southern summer, which is the orange zone on the right side. But that's just what you get for, you know, the, roughly the threshold amount of warming. If you add more nanorods, you get more warming and the orange zone will spread on this, on, on, on this graph. So what you're seeing here is latitude on the y-axis and season on the x-axis for the no nanorods case on the left, which is basically the present situation, and adding enough nanorods to start melting on the right. But of course, you start melting in the warm season. And, and then spread as you keep adding that. Bob Zubrin already brought up climate feedback. So water vapor is this potent greenhouse gas, and it will be added to the atmosphere as this warming uh, kicks in. And we have not included this feedback. And in that sense, our, with respect to that feedback, numbers are conservative. However, there are feedbacks that work the other way. So if you kick more dust up into the air on a warmer planet, that natural dust will have a cooling effect. And so that's you know a next step for the 3D modeling. The lifetime, is affected by relofting of nanorods from the surface. You know, if natural Mars dust just settled and stuck, then you would not have much dust in the Mars atmosphere. But in fact, natural dust is relofted by the air and so will these nanorods be. But actually quantifying that might require wind tunnel work because it's hard to determine for rough surfaces from first principles. Another yeah. question, if you yeah. don't mind, and maybe you'll get to this, which is two really, what is the feasibility in theory of getting enough of these nano rods on Mars, is this a fantasy or could this be, what kind of technology would be required for it? And secondly, any thoughts on possible other effects of these nano rods on a Martian biosphere? Sure. Two people are saying, get to the manufacturing. So I will get to the manufacturing. Just to say that your different materials work more or less the same. Swapping out aluminum versus iron gives the same total cross-section and other materials might work as well. And Bob did the math. You need about 12 garden hoses to warm Mars. So one garden hose is one liter per second. And so the flux to sustain the nanorods, if their lifetime is 10 years, it's about 12 liters per second. So how do you make that? Sounds, them? That sounds good. Yeah. yeah, keep going. Yeah. So the, the I'm going to focus on metal. You know, magnesium, aluminum, iron probably all work. They're abundant in Mars soil. But it doesn't have to be metal. You know, other conductive materials like magnetite, you know, could work in print, uh, could work at least from a radiative perspective. Salt to metal step, molten regolith electrolysis is one possibility. For the metal to nanorod step, you're basically looking at uh, physical vapor deposition and roll to roll processing. So you don't need to build a fab on Mars. These are relatively, the, the, the permitted failure rate is high. If 10% of the nanorods don't work, that's fine. And if the nanorods are lumpy and corrugated and slightly different lengths, that's also fine because the resonance is so broad that not getting the length perfectly right will still give you a strong boost, a strong greenhouse effect. And the sort of metal picture you'd have is not build a fab on Mars. It's more have a vacuum metalizer. You can pick them up for $200,000 on alibaba.com as the basic, you know, getting the thin film of metal. And then you need to template and lift off. But for the release, you don't need to use aircraft or cannon to inject particles high into the atmosphere. The Mars atmosphere will do that for you, just as it does for natural Mars dust. 
Why are you saying you don't need a fab on Mars? You want to, you, you need one and a half million tons a year. You're not going to ship that to Mars. You're going to make it on Mars. That, that is correct. That is our current thinking. Although in principle, you could, you know, uh, make it on Phobos. But so why yes. would you want to do that? But to go back to your fab point, factory, yes, fab, no. So fab implies a clean room, extremely, you know, low tolerance for, you know, dirt getting into the factory. And uh, so a semiconductor fab. But instead, this is more like what happens in the packaging industry when you're spraying the metal onto the inside of a, uh, a crisp packet or a food packet. Bob, when I said you don't need a fab on Mars, you do need a factory on Mars, I think. But it just doesn't have to be a exquisitely carefully constructed factory like a semiconductor fabs are. Okay. So the infrastructure needed for NASA to return astronauts to the moon enables a high cadence of 100-ton payload deliveries to Mars. On the right is, on the left is a picture of a rocket taking off from the top of another rocket, which most people in this group will be familiar with, hot staging of Starship Integrated Flight Test 2. On the right is a government accounting office cartoon of how Starship will return astronauts to the moon through many tanker refuelings in low Earth orbit. And that's the key enabling technology for Starship to get to Mars and start delivering 100 ton uh, payloads to the Mars surface. The number of Starships here is notional. This is a back of the envelope estimate of how much roll-to-roll -roll processing you could pack into Starship volume at you know current roll-to-roll -roll speeds, which are about a thousand meters uh, per minute. So I don't claim that the number of Starships shown here is the correct number. I could be off by a factor of two or even a factor of three. So this is conceptual. It just shows you the requirements. So you need uh, something to scoop the regolith, and then you need some elements to do the metal to the regolith to metal step, the metal to narrow step. And release is easy. You don't need a big pipe. You can just release it from the top of, of the Starship. What uh, are the number of Starships that you're showing here? Well, I'm saying don't take that too seriously. It I, could... I'm just asking what the number is. Are we looking at 12 or 12,000? What are you showing? That's all I'm asking. I think we're looking at 12. No, you're looking at... 14. 14. 14. 14. 14 Starships to do what? Raise the uh, global climate by 10 Kelvin. So That's... this is... Ridiculous. You said that you need a one and a half million tons a year. That is 15,000 starships. But you um, need one and a half million tons of nanorods, but you make them out of Martian regolith. Oh, that's different. But so you're saying to transport the equipment to make them. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. But another decentralized option would be instead of concentrating the nano production in one place, instead package the equipment you need into one Starship. Now, that's, in a fit, that's less efficient than the centralized planning option in a sort of Excel spreadsheet sense, but it has other advantages. For example, you get a local warming uh, at the release site that's stronger than the global warming. While, you, while you're producing, you have a plume of nanorods right above you, which gives you strong local warming. The reason for that is that Mars atmosphere has very low thermal inertia, so it quickly responds to radiative forcing. So, so you, you make a sort of a self-benefit warming hood in, in, in your local release patch, but then the narrows drift off and contribute to the global benefit pool. And that's one advantage of this approach. Another is that it could be funded by countries or private entities to support their own settlement efforts. So that's another way of thinking about it. But of course, this is an early stage concept. And although narrows could warm Mars, both the benefits and potential costs of this course of action are currently uncertain. On the cost side, if Mars has extant life, probably in the, it would be in the deep subsurface, then study of that life could have great benefits that would warrant robust protections for its habit. But on the cost minimization side, further research into nanoparticle manufacture, which was, you know, one slide or two slides in this, in this presentation, could, and modeling of their interaction with the climate, could reduce the costs of this method by finding more efficiencies. So exa example is, you know, Mars pressure wind tunnel experiments for nanorod reuptake from realistic rough surfaces. And also aerosol tracking simulations of the plume to figure out, you know, what time of day is the best place to release and what place is the best place to release. And although I haven't emphasized it today, there are also other ideas out there. For example, Laura Kerber and Robin Wordsworth proposed tiling the surface with silica aerogel, which lets sunlight in and traps infrared. And due to its low thermal kind of confines the resulting heating to the soil. And any cost-benefit calculation should include evaluating that local warming approach as well, depending on what you actually want to do at Mars. And if you do reestablish or establish a photosynthetic biosphere on the surface of Mars, it will immediately start producing food. And so it turns out that many cultures, not just you know, pre-Hispanic 
Central America, but also Central Africa, make food out of blue-green algae. And you know, it's a, it's, it's a superfood. It's very rich in protein. Uh, you know, benefits in terms of food that humans could eat start right away if you do reestablish a photosynthetic biosphere. And you know, again, this is the picture. I'm not talking about you know raising the oxygen with the assistance of a photosynthetic biosphere. That's a stage two. It might take considerably longer. But you know, this is what is enabled by warming the surface of Mars. Okay, so this wait, go back. Yeah. So this shows a cold mountaintop. So why don't you just take a brief diversion on why mountaintops are cold? Okay, sure. Uh, let's see if I have the slide in the deck. I think I have the slide in the deck. I do not have the slide in the deck. Sorry, Creon, but I can All explain. Right. This is a recent publication by a graduate student working with me, Bowen Fan, and Geophysical Research Letters. And so the data motivating the study is that on Earth, there's a really strong correlation between temperature and elevation. You go uphill, it gets cold. On Mars, that's not the case. We know from orbital thermal mapping that the temperature at the top of the Thursis volcanoes, the ground temperature, isn't much different from the temperature at the same latitude, but at the foot of the mountain. So why is that? The obvious difference is the atmosphere is thin, both in terms of its greenhouse effect and in terms of just its density. And so we want to know which matters. And so what Bone did is he used an idealized but three-dimensional global circulation model and put in many different atmospheres, including atmospheres that had strong greenhouse effect but were thin atmosphere, and atmospheres that were high density in terms of kilograms per cubic meters, but had weak greenhouse effect. And what Bone found is that it's the greenhouse effect that matters, much more than the kilograms per meter cubed in the atmosphere. So now we know why tops aren't very cold on Mars, and it's the weakness of the greenhouse effect, not the low. Okay, so if I can paraphrase that, on Earth, it is the case that the atmosphere is thinner at the top of the mountains, but it's not the fact that it's thinner that is the issue. It's the fact that because it's thinner, there's less greenhouse gas. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there's so less gas above you. You're above the serious atmosphere. Uh, Mount Everest is one third the pressure of sea level. So you're above two thirds of the atmosphere. Yeah, but what Edwin is saying, I think, is that it's that you are above two thirds of the greenhouse gas. It's not that you're above two thirds of the bulk atmosphere. It's the same thing. Okay, fair enough. We don't need to argue. Okay, look, can I start the Q&A? Because we're less than 20 minutes left to go. Perfect timing. This is my take home. Okay. So you worked on the Curiosity team, at least for the last few years. Can you say maybe a brief survey of the kind of work you did? Because it's a big team with lots of different instruments and investigations. So what was your angle? Sure. The Curiosity mission is on its fourth extended mission. It was uh, intended to have a two-year mission, and I guess it's year 11 or year 12 now. And what those mission extensions have allowed is further progress through Mars history. At the bot at the foot of the mountain are clay-rich sediments interpreted as deposited in a lake. And now over the last you know two years, the picture has changed and the rover team is seeing deposits from sand dunes with occasional, you know, small lakes. A discovery just from the from 2020 was, and maybe I do have this in my deck, the, the overall dry conditions from the last two years were interrupted by a brief wet event with beautiful wave ripples recording wind, you know, blowing over a, a shallow lake, which spread apparently across many kilometers of the mountain. And we're still trying to understand that brief excursion uh, to wet conditions on the overall drying trend. The something that may be of interest to this group is that the sediments recording that brief wet excursion are extremely rich in metals. 40 weight percent iron, we reported at the last Lunar Planetary Science Conference, 2 weight percent zinc, 2 weight percent manganese. Now, if you found that on Earth, it wouldn't quite be all grade, but it's getting close. And to uh, my mind, at least, that's a uh, flag that the processes, the geologic processes that on Earth lead to economically useful concentrations of metals, some of them at least were also at work on Mars. Okay, last question before we go to general audience, and I see that Ron's raised his hand, but my last question for you is, so you've been uh, working with the Curiosity team. Do you work at all with the other uh, similar rover team, or it doesn't it have some different instruments, and is that relevant to you, or is it just you're stuck on one? Some the project leadership, of course, talk to each other, and there are a, a good sprinkling of scientists who uh, participate in both missions, which helps to make sure that we keep each other up to date. 
but they but they are separate projects. I'm a participating scientist on Curiosity, not Perseverance. Okay, okay can great. we talk about the paper? Second, I'd like to ask some questions about your paper. The first of all, I've read a preprint of, of your. Public- sorry, sorry, Bob. Um, we have one in the queue, and then. We have Ekaterina in the queue, and then you're welcome to go after, but we have a queue sure. of hands okay. that, that were hand raises. Thank you. If you want to... Thanks. Um, start my video so you can see. Well, never mind. You can hear me, right? I can see you. All right. Edwin, great. You know, the, the, the science of your idea is really cool, very innovative. I want to pull on a thread that Bob had also um, hit on, which is the infrastructure needed to have an impact. And I've seen your chart. You know how I've seen your chart with a preliminary infrastructure and the 14 starships and everything, it still seems a little, it still seems like there's a little bit of a disconnect between the amount of mass in nano rods that you have to inject gas in the atmosphere and the idea that you could do that with just the 14, you know, the 14 starship loads of payload. Can you elaborate on the infrastructure needed to make this happen? Sure. My starting point for uh, thinking through this, the mining problem, is work that has been done in the 70s, 80s, 90s on mining on the moon. Scraping up Mars regolith is not that different from scraping up lunar regolith. And it turns out that the, you know, the, the basic infrastructure for a comparable amount of material being scraped up on the moon is, looks something like this. You know, cable-operated drag scraper, 19th century technology, and you know, some lunar mining studies with similar amounts of regular things to be processed you know, involve a mobile scraper. So instead of having a static uh, pulley, it, it is itself on, on, on a wheeled truck. So remember that the, if we're going with metals, the metals that we want are really abundant in the soil. So magnesium, iron, and aluminum are all separately present at you know, 5, 10 weight percent level. So that reduces the amount of regolith you need to process. So that's on the on the mining side. On the you know get, uh, getting the metal out of the regolith and then converting the metal to nanorod, that could end up being driven by consumables like the cathode and the anode for the metal regolith electrolysis, or the template for the roll to roll if you can't reuse it indefinitely. And so those are examples of things that could definitely drive up the amount of infrastructure that you actually need to do this. But I'm not too worried about the regular processing or the, the regular acquisition beneficiary side of it because that's been worked out in a lunar context. However, I think you know others on this call may know more than me about lunar mining. You know, feel free to jump in. Are you assuming a human infrastructure to support you? No, I think you know AI is developing extremely fast. Humanoid robots are developing extremely fast. It's just not clear to me where we'll be with humanoid robots and AI even at 2030, which is the earliest reasonable time. When something like this could start, no, I, I don't. I, I could imagine either uh, it working in parallel with human, with early human settlement, perhaps supporting it by providing local warming, or it could work in series where you warm the planet first and humans only arrive later. So I'd, I'd love to have some follow-on conversation with you on based yeah. on some feedback that we've given you. Um, okay, it would, it would be fantastic. Okay, so I'll let other people ask their questions now. But I really enjoy the. The fo- having a follow up with you. Sounds good. Yeah, let's do it. Great. I'm happy to coordinate um, in case you need any coordination help. Next one here, we have Ekaterina. Yeah. Hi, everyone. First, Edwin, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. So, my question will be not about exactly the technology that you presented, but more in a general sense. Sure. How do you think what should happen to humanity for our species to take on decision like that? like warming Mars. I'm not saying right now, should it happen or should it not happen? And the reason for my question is that right now, as usual, the sector already experienced some problems, even when we say that we want to go to the moon, because a lot of people, our society doesn't see it as a good reason to spend the money. This is the first one. And when we currently, right now, we are on the stage of finding out (laughs) how we messed up with the climate on Earth. Mm -hmm. And there is a high chance that even in the future, you know, people will be skeptic to try to do something with the climate on another planet. Just, yeah. How do you think what should happen? What actually, what things should happen for the humanity to take on decision to warm Mars? Thank you so much. Working backwards, of course, climate skepticism, the idea that humans were not responsible for observed global warming, persisted for decades in part because people 
couldn't believe that humans could alter the climate of an entire planet. But of course, we are. And you know, our decisions will regulate the climate of a planet, Earth. And so it's just a question of the quality of those decisions. You know, various options, carbon sequestration, geoengineering, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of the first question, you know, I guess it's who gives permission and will there be enough people interested to ask permission? So who gives permission in practice? It's going to be either the government of the United States or the government of China, right? You know, unless there's some radical change in global politics in the next 20 years. In terms of will there be enough people interested in warming Mars to, you know, be asking permission? Yeah, I think so. I think there are already lots of people who uh, have been excited about this. This is where we you know, we're almost 50 years into, you know, serious thinking about, you know, what would be necessary to warm us. Does that answer your question, Katerina? Yeah, thank you so much for the answers. But I want to say that we, as the people who are really interested in space and the space sector, space technology stuff, I think we live in a bubble. And when you go outside, there are a lot of people that even will say, oh, that's no, we don't need that. But yeah, I hear your answer. Thank you so much. And one small question. So just a really small one. Are you part of any projects right now that are helping with the current climate situation on Earth? Because mm -hmm. what I see from your work is some kind of climate engineering. And climate engineering can one of the solutions to, to work with the climate on Earth also. Sure. I'm not personally involved in climate mitigation. I am a planetary scientist by training, uh, but many of my colleagues are looking at a wide range of geoengineering strategies to help deflect or avoid the consequences or, or reverse temperature rise. For example, as some people have suggested injecting cold water or warm water or deflecting currents flowing to the base of glaciers that we worry about as you know, keystone keystones holding back ice flow from Antarctica into the sea. And of course, people have suggested releasing aerosols into our atmosphere as one way of cooling us. But I'm not personally involved in any of those efforts. Yeah. But if you're oh, interested, yeah. I can send you links to papers that uh, discuss that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. That's it from my side. Thank you. Bumped and fire away. All right. First of all, let me just say, I think it's a very important paper. I've read the preprint of your uh, journal article. And I'm very interested in this and got a couple of comments and I got a couple of questions. Okay. One is the paper gives 30 cubic liters of uh, material per second. You're giving three here. So there's a factor of 10 difference between the estimate of material in the paper and here. However, let me say either way, this is uh, potentially in the doable range. It, it, you should know if you're making iron at the higher number, which was the number in the paper, the power requirement is on the order of uh, three gigawatts, which is about the power that powers Chicago. So this is a significant amount of power, but it's not like something, it's a small fraction of what the human race currently uses. It's very large compared to what we're going to have on a first mission to Mars. But the, but, and if we go with the smaller number, it's 300 megawatts. And you should know a modular nuclear reactor with a little bit of optimism on the engineering, uh, but not outrageous. It, a 30 megawatt reactor would be 90 tons. So one starship for 30 megawatts, which would mean 10 to transport the power supply at your more optimistic estimate and 100 at the other estimate. The amount of mining you're talking about is not that great. At the lower number, it's around 3,000 tons of material a day, which is a cube 10 meters on a side. It, it, that's what 3,000 tons is. It's, that's 1,000 cubic meters at a, at a mass, uh, a specific mass of three. Uh, and at the other thing, it's somewhat larger, but still not particularly uh, huge. The, the, you're going to get very positive greenhousing from the water vapor here. Because, for instance, at Mars currently has about one pascal of uh, water vapor in its atmosphere. And if you could raise it to minus 20 C, is a vapor pressure water be 100 pascals. So that would increase the water vapor in the atmosphere by two orders of magnitude, which, by the way, itself would be of tremendous utility, but it would also be a greenhousing agent. I, I am interested in now also as the atmosphere thickens, your residence time in the atmosphere should increase because the, there'd be more aerodynamic buoyancy or 
uh, lift or however you would describe it. That would work in your favor. I think Joukowsky's estimates of CO2 reserves are have no basis. Maven did not measure the amount of CO2 in the regolith or anywhere. It only measured current loss rates. And as Chris McKay pointed out, Joukowsky claimed that it would have lost half a bar of CO2 over the Mars's lifetime. Uh, Chris McKay has pointed out that in order for Mars to have been greenhoused enough for liquid water in the past, it would have had to have two bars of CO2. In fact, the, a lot of things have been said about Joukowsky's paper that uh, it, it really is not relevant to, we don't know how much CO2 is there. Okay, but yeah, I- A note on top. I'm, we have one more minute. Okay, so I've got a question. How to let do answer to this? conductive do these rods need to be? We don't know. What we know is that aluminum and iron work fine. And for context for the rest of the audience, Bob, me, and my collaborator, Ramses Ramirez, have been talking about other materials, but we don't have an answer for you, for you yet, Bob. We don't know. Because uh, carbon is semiconductive, and actually silicon is a pretty good conductor in the metal state. They're rare on Mars, aren't they? Silicon is not rare on Mars. Silicon is extremely common on Mars. But and, just and if you don't have to do pure iron silicon mixtures, basically crap iron would be pretty conductive. You know, you're not using it for structural purposes. You're just using it to for particles. Yeah, I, I think that's all great. That all sounds good. Your numbers uh, match my numbers. Like factor three stuff uh, right at the beginning of your comment, Bob. That's basically, we submitted the paper, but kept working. And some of the numbers you're seeing are from, like the red line here is an improvement uh, that we did after we submitted the paper. I see. And one final comment is, I believe this will be done after Mars is settled. Those are the people that would have an interest in terraforming Mars. There'll be no question to Martian settlers the value of terraforming Mars. All right. We're really nearing the end here. We're only one minute over and I want to be really mindful of your time, Edwin. Just are there any final bits and pieces that you want to mention, any ways in which people can get in touch with you, can support your work if they're interested? And on my end, just for closing it out, thank you so much. This was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I learned a lot in, in the seminar. Thank you so much for joining and for giving such a really well thought, well researched uh, presentation on a very, I think, exciting topic. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And thank you, Alison, for the invitation. If you'd like to discuss more, email is the best way to contact me. It's on this slide. And I'd be happy. My next meeting is not until 1.30, so I'd be happy to stick around and talk more. And I'd like to invite you to give a plenary on this at the next Mars Society Conference, which will be August in Seattle. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So I sent you an email. I sent you an email, Edwin. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, everybody. I've got to go. I've got to go. But thank you, Creole, for moderating. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. This was a great talk. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone, for your amazing questions and for your engagement. I hope to see you at the next one. Have a really good one. Thank you, Edwin. Bye-bye, everyone.